This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, ideas, and interviews from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood. Got a really cool episode for you today. Uh, We're joined by Tim Burrows. Now, Tim's the author of the book, Media Unmade, Australian Media's Most Disruptive Decade. Here's a synopsis of the book. Media Unmade presents the definitive story of the decade in which big media in Australia was cut down to size, a decade that forever altered what had until then been perceived as the unbreachable foundations of the industry in this country. Drawing on insights from his ringside seat, independent journalist, commentator and Mumbrella founder, Tim Burrows knits together the big events and conversations with key players then and now to reveal the drama and tell the story behind the changes that every consumer of Australian media had witnessed over the past decades. Now, I've read this book. It is a brilliant read for anyone working in media. Obviously, I'm familiar with Tim through Mumbrella, and I'm a big fan of his new venture, Unmade, which is actually not only a book, but it's now a podcast and a daily newsletter, and what promises to be a a really exciting new business model too, which he might get into a bit as well. I thought what would be really interesting about having a chat to Tim is that he could offer a unique insight into the media sales teams of these companies over the decade. What do the best sales teams have in common? Uh, how did the sales teams you know, interpret and respond to some of this disruption in the market? And most importantly, what lessons can we take from this book and from the past decade into the next 10 years in media sales? Really excited to have this chat. Uh, shout out to Damien Francis, who has actually just joined Unmade as well. Um, and I know that he is a listener of the podcast too, which he kindly shared on my LinkedIn, which I'm going to plug shamelessly every episode moving forward. If you want to hit me up with a question for the listener question segment, if you want to interact with a lot of the posts that I put out, if you want to give me suggestions and or critiques and or hurl abuse at me for any of the podcast content or topic ideas, LinkedIn is the way to do it. It's in the description, it's in the show notes, or it's Jamie Wood. Just search me at LinkedIn. You will find me very easily. We're going to get into the episode now. The first five. Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, Jamie, great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. And I hear you're coming to us from beautiful Tasmania at the moment. I am. It's a beautiful early evening in the summer in northwest Tasmania as uh, as we're recording, although I look in the forecast and I see that that will come to an end in about two hours' time <laughs> when the rain sweeps in, which is which is also very Tasmania as well. So... Um, but I've learned I've learned the couple of years I've been living here that you're you're always glad for that because uh, it means that soon the uh, the water tanks will fill up. Oh, I love it. I, d- I do enjoy reading Unmade and hearing you know which part of the globe you might be in that day. And we were reflecting off air, obviously about Unmade and the journey so far. So I I did a bit of a synopsis on Unmade in the intro. I've read the book myself. I'm a big fan. I think I was one of the first to get a copy, um, which uh, Adam Lang called out and said he hadn't received his yet. So <laughs> we'll shout out to him. But Perhaps for those who are maybe unfamiliar, can you give us a bit of background on your journey to not only writing Unmade, but obviously founding Mumbrella, and uh, what have you been doing most recently? Yeah, look, there have been a few twists and turns along the way. It's, it's probably worth mentioning that by, by background, I've always been a journalist, mm. um, you know, right from the age of uh, 18. So to begin with, that was on local newspapers. And then um, over time, I moved to kind of the sort of the B2B kind of specialist press i suppose which included initially editing a magazine called hospital doctor in the uk which as you might guess um was uh, was read by hospital doctors um and then after that i started writing about the media and marketing industry so that was media week in the uk which focused on media agencies then a couple of years um as the launch editor of the middle east edition of campaign magazine before coming to australia to to be the um, the the almost final print editor of BNT, um, certainly the last weekly print editor of BNT magazine before starting Mumbrella back in uh, two thousand and eight, um, and 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 sort of I guess before we talk about the the Australian side of things, it's it's perhaps worth noting. You know, one of my experiences has always been 
the key relationship between the editor and the sales director or whatever that head of sales role is in B2B is an incredibly key one for the success of the publication, which then once um, once we launched Mumbrella, where obviously I was both an editorial voice, but also an owner, came to appreciate all the more because, you know, all of our success was intrinsically tied up with the abilities of our sales team. Absolutely. I mean, trade media, in my opinion, I've said this in the past, actually does it better than a lot of organizations. The The push and pull between content and sales feels like it's naturally there, but it feels a lot more collaborative and cohesive than maybe other media organizations that are consumer facing. Um, I mean, would that be a fair assessment? It's certainly been my observation. When it works well, definitely. Um, and you can really see a, a couple of circumstances you need. I think one is you need the editorial people to genuinely appreciate and respect the role that the sales team has got. And then uh, you, you really need a, a, a sales team that understands the product and reads it as closely as the audience will, which, 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 funnily enough, doesn't always actually uh, actually happen. Um, so certainly in our in our kind of days with with Mumbrella, the sort of you know mantra we used to say to our editorial people was, well, you know, your job is to help the sales team when you can, but bearing in mind that the role of the salespeople is to be the champion of the audience and really only write for the audience, but to be genuinely sorry when you can't. Mm, mm. It's a really interesting intersection because, like, reflecting on your book, Media Unmade, as I was reading it, what was particularly interesting to me as, a, I guess, a career media sales leader, um, I was putting myself in the shoes of the sales directors during these tumultuous periods in all these organizations that you were you were covering. And I suppose when researching the book, I'm just curious to know if, if you kind of got a sense of how some of these high-level media organizational strategies were being received by the sales teams at the time. Look, it's funny because you, you do get little glimpses along the way or flashbacks sometimes as well. You know, I, I for instance, remember uh, uh, Peter Wiltshire, who was the um, sales director of the Nine Network, sort of pre the, the, the merger with Fairfax, talking about uh, the rise of programmatic. And I, I've many a time I've tried to find a note because I've got a very, I've got really strong memory of it, but I, I I, I can't understand why nobody reported at the time, but um, I'm pretty sure he used the phrase over my dead body when he talked about taking uh, programmatic into the television industry. And of course, you know, finally we have seen it begin to happen, mm -hmm. even if we're, we're talking about television being quite sensible in controlling the negotiations still, even if the placement is automated. So you have those sort of examples where, you know, the, 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 the sales dynamic on the ground is, is different to the direction of travel or, you know, you probably look similarly at the, the radio networks and, you know, I think even of particularly sort of what was uh, Macquarie Media and is now part of Nine Radio, they were very slow into the podcast side of things. And, you know, I remember a, a someone senior from the sales team there saying, you know, you've got to fish where the fish are, meaning they weren't going to invest ahead of the curve for um, podcasting and streaming, which, of course, is coming through so strongly now. So so you, you I, I, I guess maybe that's the difference is, the CEOs set the strategy for where the company is going and the salespeople have to hunt where the money is right now. It's a really good call and I think you're absolutely correct. There's the constant sort of time horizon. You're in the here and now. You're playing what's in front of you but always having that strategic view of the future. And, you know, in my observation, I've always really noticed when there's a misalignment in the sales strategy and the, and the actual corporate strategy because – you have a CEO out in market talking about the next three to five to 10 years for the sector, and then a sales team that are very much going, well, the target that I need to hit now is is effectively going to come from the core business, and it's going to come from focusing on these assets. It does create a really interesting tension there. Media Sales Mastery. Which leads to the, the first question, which is, um, you know, reflecting on the past 10 years, and I sort of just opened this one up 
as, as a general uh, observation, a media salesperson working for a large publisher right now, how much of the past 10 years could be used as a predictor for the next 10? You know, what, what do you anticipate is going to happen structurally in the media sector? I reckon anything more than a year out and you're really just rolling the dice because, mm. you know, so much is, is, is going to change and so much change. You know, if we look back a decade and as, as you say the, the in, in the book, in Media Unmade, it, it looks at that span from 2010 to, through to, well, it became the, it became the 12 year decade of 2010 to 2021. <laughs> um, and, um, and in that time, so much changed. You know, we, <laughs> If you go right back to that start, I think most of us were still hanging on to our Blackberries and we, we, we really weren't ready to switch across to iPhones. You know, the uh, the music streaming services didn't exist. Certainly the video streaming services didn't exist. You know, it was, we, we, we forget how quickly all of this has changed. And then, of course, um, as I quote, I think um, Chris Stevenson from from PhD Media in the book, um, and I think he was quoting somebody else when he said it on stage, the pace of change will never be as slow again. It's just going to go get faster and faster. So I, I'd be reasonably confident predicting that the next 12 months or so are going to be mostly a period of consolidation as the big media companies normalise after COVID. Uh, they've all got different reasons for drawing breath. Um, Seven have got the prime merger to get used to. HT&E have got the takeover of grant broadcasters to get used to. We've seen in the outdoor space, uh, O-Media return to its knitting and move away from junkie. So you, you can see a lot of uh, organisations where if they're going to do a really good deal in the future, they need to have, just have a really good profitable year, first of all, by sticking to the knitting. So so I'm willing to predict it won't be a particularly dramatic, transformative year. But for the decade, um, hey, look, it will be the decade where um, the singularity will approach this arrival of um, AI getting smart enough to do most things a human can think of and what that means for media you know whole books have been written about it um, by incredibly smart people and even then nobody quite knows but that feels like that will be one of the massive disruptors. That's a, a really interesting point you make around consolidation because it leads naturally into the next question which was Media publishers will typically do an acquisition. They'll be very, very uh, quick to go to market and talk about the strategic rationale as to why. I mean, the HT&E play with Grant is, you know, an absolute no-brainer from a strategic standpoint. It's it's absolutely the right asset to then bring in because it's part of the core business. It gives them the regional. Um, so that makes sense. What I'm interested about is they're going to market talking about this. But as a media and marketing journalist, and you know, you're know, you someone with a lot of access to the insiders, I'm really interested to understand what's the reality on the ground for people behind these big structural shifts. You know, If they're going to market saying uh, it's this great new proposition, how is that typically being received when the change is happening from the people inside the organization that are then taking that out to market? Well, one of the things we have to remember is sometimes people at the time inside the organizations don't know the whole plan. You know, if you look back at the final couple of years of Fairfax Media, for example, before the merger with Nine, you had um, at the main offices in uh, in Sydney on Darling Island, effectively managing for decline. Revenues were going down each year. Profits were falling fast. But what those people didn't know, or certainly most people didn't know, was there was this team in a secret office in Surrey Hills, the blue team, working on a whole new model, a publishing model for the newspapers that would give them a much longer term future. So they were being asked to kind of, I guess, tough it out. They didn't have the whole picture. It would have just felt like being in this company that was lurching from crisis to crisis because they couldn't afford to tell them what the plan was. Um, so there was a, you know, there was a fairly short window in 2017, 2018, where um, Fairfax span off domain to give it a bit more more time and got itself into a position where at least the shareholders were able to um, keep their shirts in a in a not quite equals merger, but almost equals merger with nine. That was a really fascinating chapter in the Media Unmade book. I remember reading it was 
interesting, almost like this innovation hub that was just split out to effectively kind of redesign the whole business model. And I wonder whether they needed to be extracted from the core business in the day-to-day in order to be able to effectively do that and objectively b- design what the new strategy was going to be. Look, I think sometimes there's a lot to be said for an outsider who doesn't feel too emotionally connected to the way of doing things if you need a big change. Now, of course, I think one of the reasons why it doesn't always work when consultants come in is they don't necessarily understand the dynamics of a business as well. But of course, in that Fairfax example, Greg Highwood was able to come back to the business and was able to bring in people who understood how it worked, but weren't intrinsically connected to or friends with the people who were doing the day to day so they could make the difficult decisions so so I think yeah sometimes you do just need a uh, somebody with a little bit of distance when you need the big change it's that thing of you know when an organization really needs changing they probably need to hire from outside and when they want to make you know kind of some slight course corrections and steady the ship then they'll promote from within it's interesting thinking about structurally how the machine behind these types of changes works too. I mean, with consolidation happening, what I'm finding really interesting is seeing publishers move towards owning and operating multiple media assets that might not be in the same channel. Um, You know, it's one thing to acquire a bunch of audio assets, be it traditional or digital, regional, metro. Fundamentally, the proposition and the core business still feels aligned but in the scenarios where you have a publisher that, like a nine, that own radio, TV, digital, um, very much moving into this sort of house of different media assets, have you really, I suppose, have you dug deep into the sales structures and the commercial structures and how to take that proposition to market effectively? And and I'm I'm just curious to know if um if this kind of question of specialization, i.e. having a, a a media representative out in market selling a channel passionately versus having a media representative out in market representing the full asset base, have you seen that work, not work? Who's done it well? What's your general observation on what you think the right model kind of is um reflecting on the last ten years? Well, look, it's a pendulum that swings back and forth, that's for sure. So organisationally, it goes from one way to another. Uh, I guess over the sort of sweep of the last decade, we saw over at News Corp um, in the kind of the relatively short time that Kim Williams was the CEO, move to a much more centralised structure rather than the individual state by state fiefdoms. And we'll actually never know whether that was the right plan or not, because Kim Williams lost his political battles with the with the editors and was ousted before the plan could be could be fully carried out. But the the early signs were pretty worrying in the sales revenue seemed to drop as you know local connections were lost. Now whether that would have settled and it would have moved to the new rhythm, we 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 won't know. Um, but yeah, look, I think there's definitely this human thing that um, hey, look, you know, I I you know I think about my my own times as a journalist and I think we would have said the same about our salespeople you know I I didn't work for Trinity Mirror I worked for the Crawley News I didn't think of myself as working for Reed Elsevier I thought of myself as working for Hospital Doctor um, you know in my final years after we sold Mumbrella I, I thought of myself first and foremost as still working for Mumbrella not diversified media so I think some of it is that that human thing of the bit that salespeople can take ownership of um and then we see it changing you know i mean you 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 know you mentioned nine as a as the example the certainly the biggest locally based locally headquartered media company um which of course is in multimedia now i think what um media agencies want and what advertisers want is to be able to make a single call or have a single conversation. But equally, there are sales leads for each discipline. So there's there's a sales lead for what they call Total TV, which obviously is both broadcast and streaming now. Um, there's a sales lead for what they call Total Publishing, so that's both print and digital. And then there's a sales lead for Total Audio across you know, radio and, and also streaming audio. Now that's the structure they've just moved to in the in the last few weeks as we're recording this, um, and some of that is also probably a response to the practicalities of 
the talent available within the organisation at the time because it, it sort of, you know, followed so a, a, a departure from the organisation as well. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing is, the, 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 these things keep changing. I don't think there is one answer. So, hey, look, I'd be amazed if that's still the same structure in five years' time because it always changes. It really does. Yeah, no, I, I'm really interested around that because to me, you're right, the pendulum swings both ways and there's a very valid argument for both. And it just has always felt to me like nobody has necessarily nailed what best practice is. And maybe it's just the rate of change, you know, is, is a big driver of that. Things don't settle long enough in order to prove one hypothesis or the other. Yeah, and, and, and probably some of it is going right back to that starting point of, I guess what, what you want as an organisation is you want your salesperson to have a conversation with the client and understand their problems and then be able to help solve them. And the whole job of the organisation is to help the salesperson to get to that point. It's a very good call. And I think, you know, not to uh, I obviously know a few people at Nine, like shout out to Richard Hunwick, who is the head of Total TV now. He's a proud Brisbane guy. The interesting thing about Nine is they are sort of a branded house and a house of brands. I feel like they've managed to get that that combination quite right in terms of going to market as the publisher as opposed to, you know, your your very salient point before. Similar to Mumbrella. I mean, you know, I, I can recall going to Mumbrella 360 events, listening to the Mumbrella podcast, reading the website, looking to the newsletter. Um, it, it very much felt like Mumbrella was a, a brand and a content proposition and the distribution really started to expand across a number of different channels over the duration of, uh, you know, 10 years' time or, or how long it was um, from when it was founded. And I think in fairness, that's probably something which um, there was nothing particularly revolutionary in us taking that approach. It was just what I'd learned to do mm. in in old school B2B publishing. You know, you, you build the brand, you build the trust in the audience, you understand your place in what the audience want from you and the way I used to describe it with Mumbrella was is to help our audience in their working lives and their careers, which of course could be the reporting of the news, but it, it could also be putting on a conference that um, explains where we're going as an industry. It could be organising an awards to celebrate good work. But so long as you always had that sort of navigation and that you didn't go too far from that as your brand, then there were different ways of... Um, of, of, of sort of you know building that that that, that B two B proposition, which which again I suppose is what I'm doing now with 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 the new thing, which is unmade the the newsletter, which is you know it's different it's it's different levers we're pulling because it's it's at least in part a subscription model, mm. but again it's 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 old school B two B publishing done in a new way. I for whatever reason, I really have a fascination and a deep affinity with trade media. I just love it. I, I like the, I like the way they structure the businesses. I like the way they target a very niche audience. I think there's definitely a, a, a job to do with trade media. Sometimes maybe steering away from being a bit of a cash generation machine, like they can tend towards just really um, trying to sell quite aggressively to an industry sector. Um, rather than maybe having a bit more of a purpose and a bit of a, a value system like maybe what Mumbrella had. You know, what? what's kind of all interesting about this is we're talking about platforms and content distribution. And I think if we talk about the idea of product innovation as a really broad catch-all, you know, a new proposition coming to market, um, think about what's happening with linear TV at the moment where they're really trying to uh, look at selling that in a new and different way. Um with a new proposition that comes to market, there's always a need for the sales force to really mobilize in tandem with some good uh, trade media, no doubt, but to mobilize and educate the market to stimulate some level of appetite and intrigue into what this new proposition is to show how it can be applied. What are some of the maybe the mis missteps or perhaps some of the triumphs that you've observed media organizations do in this space when they're really trying to push out a new proposition? Look, something I've learned, and this, you know, this was specific to, to, to the learnings on Mumbrella and other places I'd, I'd worked on, was with new propositions, you've actually got to sell it into the sales team in the first place, because 
as you would know, salespeople find it a lot harder to sell something when they either can't quite see it or don't quite believe in it. And I can think of a number of times where I had a really clear idea in my mind's eye of what a product was going to be. And I really struggled struggled with our first running of it for us to commercialize it because I hadn't succeeded in getting the sales team to see what I saw mm. and then we ran it and it would be successful and it would get audience engagement and the sales team would become believers so I think there's definitely something to be said with new propositions that the the biggest part of the battle is finding ways of genuinely helping the sales team see what it is about it that's going to be special that's actually going to help their clients is it a case of sometimes to your point just there rather than maybe iterating in real time or doing some some testing organizations are quite quick to rush out the new thing you know maybe there's a an opportunity to kind of go to market in a big way and it happens to be the start of the year and we've got this thing that's ready to go as opposed to what you said like maybe investing in building something and uh and very slowly kind of taking it to market and having a proof of concept and maybe a case study or two to then utilize to kind of leverage a bit of a bit of appetite and, and demand from the market. I think you're right. Um, but I, I think I also have to say it wasn't how I used to behave. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't strategic enough when it came to that sort of thing. And looking back, there are times where, yeah, I wish I had done more to help build out an understanding of the proposition to make it easier for the for the sales team to really take examples to the market. You know, and it's a it's that old cliche, isn't it? The market always wants something that's a media first and brand new, but they also want all of the risk taken out. Correct. A media first with a proof of concept and a de-risking of the uh, investment being squandered. That's the that's the secret sauce to uh, <laughs> to taking something new out, I feel. And if the media owner can also help the uh, media agency write their awards entry for the MFA, <laughs> then that will be a bonus too. Exactly. It's really interesting, though, sitting on this side of the fence. I mean, I, I've obviously been in media a long time. I've been through a lot of change. Um, and I think you really nailed a point before, like sales team adoption a great product or proposition or opportunity can be squandered very quickly if it doesn't go through a, a very rigorous process of actually bringing the sales team along on the journey. Um, I think co-creation to an extent is a really important thing. Um, being able to bring people who are you know at the coalface, connected into the market, across the innovations, across what the appetite is from the market, bringing them in early and just consulting and going, look, we're, we're looking to build this thing. Would you be interested in having some input? Very, very um, much best practice. And it's always been a very critical thing to a successful launch, in my opinion, when taking a new thing out. That being said, and I, I sort of want to end this segment on a question. It's a bit of a loaded question, but I'm going to ask you because I'm sure you probably have an opinion and you'll share it. Who, in your opinion, does it the best, Tim? You know, you've had a good overview of the entire media and advertising market in the last 10 years writing the book, in the last couple of years of COVID, looking to the future, you know, being being um, obviously based now internationally and looking at Australia maybe through a different international lens. I'd just love to know, like, who do you think is the best sales team and or historically has been the best sales team and why? Yeah, gosh. Um, I think there are different answers for big and small. Okay. Um, I think if you look at the sheer level of professionalism, and drive to stay at the cutting edge of where things are going and how things are being traded, it's very hard to go past nine. You know, they're just such a good operation at so many levels when it comes to, to sales on that on, on that big side of things. You know, it's not just about brute force power, although they've 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 got the heft. There's also a bunch of quite big brains in there as well. And then I think the other one I'd think of as much smaller, but probably for one that really punched above its weight over much of the decade, was if you look back at the stories that Junkie Media was able to tell back when it was, particularly when it was independent, yep. the way it owned that youth space and positioned themselves as the, not the even the experts on youth publishing, but the experts on youth and the way they owned that story in the market allowed them to act so much bigger than they actually were and that was uh, that was incredibly impressive strategic salesmanship 
that was absolutely that was such a great uh, call actually because that youth research piece was notorious in market. It was it was a really good example of really good targeted coordinated trade activity and very much a content play. I mean, if you think about it, there was there was not much sell there of junkie. It was very much an education and information piece, which very much just created this perception. Um, well, rightly so, probably, that they were the authority on that generation and that audience. I think that was the point. It yeah. definitely, it it wasn't the junkie up fronts. It was, here's junkie helping you understand this audience. Absolutely. Well, we're going to jump into the next segment. I can't ask my sales manager that. And this was a question that a listener submitted via my LinkedIn, which I'm going to shamelessly and overtly plug moving forward on this podcast, um, because I really appreciate getting these listener questions. So here it is. Hey, Jamie, I work for a traditional media outlet that I fear is going to be in a major decline longer term. Audience and revenues have already started to move backwards and they're reducing headcount. But with this, I've also been able to progress my career and take advantage of opportunities for promotion. I'm trying to decide whether it's best to look at moving into a new medium or whether I should stay put and climb the ladder first. It's quite the dilemma. Um, I dare say that's the dilemma that a lot of media salespeople are facing. Initial impression reflecting on that question, Tim, what do you think uh, might be some sage advice for this person? Well, look, I, I suppose one of the things is most people who found themselves in a situation of being in a fading medium would also, I think, if they look back, have also had the opportunity to get exposure to where it was going. So if you think about newspapers, then, you know, a huge part of the story of newspapers has been their, their renaissance with the, the rise of digital and I guess arguably the shift to um, subscriptions as being the, the, the primary revenue stream rather than, than advertising. Um, you know, if you think about, hey, the, 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 if we use the cliche, the sunset of broadcast television, only it's not because mm. um, broadcast video on demand, whether it's advertising supported or subscription supported, um, has completely changed the game. So I can't think of many mediums which genuinely don't offer the exposure to what's new and exciting. Um, but wow, if if it's just a chance to climb the ladder on a dying medium then that's pretty depressing isn't it like how many people actually climb there out of the top and and then are in a good situation to move across to something new not not very many i suspect yeah it's a dilemma i had too because there's an argument for both but i would be erring to what towards the side of if you don't see a future proofing strategy for this organization or this medium it probably be best to get out um, because at the end of the day, your career isn't about the next couple of years or the, the sugar hit that a promotion might afford you. Um, it's very much about being in a sector that's stable and being in a medium that is, uh, you know, that is, that is working proactively to maybe create its own destiny. Um, so the only, the only kind of follow-up question I had for this, for this person was, Really make sure that your core business isn't just being cannibalized by another part of your business. So if you're saying revenues are declining or people are being removed, are they being redeployed to another part of the organization or is there more focus and investment just being put somewhere else? Because that's a different play, you know, as opposed to just a cost out exercise. So that would be my only probably advice for this person as well. Hey, look, and I suppose the other thing to also add in is um, what's your boss like? Are you still learning from them? Yep. Do you actually like the job? That also matters an awful lot as well. It's a really good call, Tim. Are you are you learning or earning or both? Hey, um, I've really enjoyed this chat. I, I know we were going to get into the weeds um, a little bit more, but I wanted to just kind of really touch at a high level across this because I want people to go read your book. Um, if I can offer any advice to anyone, it's read Media Unmade, read the book. Um, take the lessons from it and then even come back and maybe we'll we'll jump on and we'll do a future episode where we unpack a little bit more based on some listener questions that might come in, Tim. Um, but I wanted to round this out by asking you, you know, what you've got going on with the Unmade business now and into the future. Can you give us a bit of an overview of what Unmade is all about beyond the book and uh, and how people can engage with the content that you're currently putting out? 
Yeah, so the the easiest bit for engaging with the content, and thank you for the invitation to talk about it, is the URL is simply unmade.media, which might actually be terrible branding when the book was called Media Unmade. (laughs) Um, But um, I write several times a week about the media and marketing industry, where it's going, where it's been, trying to just offer some context and analysis, I guess a lot of which has been inspired by the work I put in on, on, on um, doing the book. Um, recently, I was joined by a former Umbrella colleague and Damien Francis as we begin to hopefully professionalise Unmade and begin to turn it into a business. So there are two of us now. Now, um, you were kind enough to uh, suggest I might want to make uh, create some sort of offer for your audience uh, because we do have a, a paid tier. Some of our content is is does go behind the paywall, which is um, where we, we, we hopefully try and extract some value. So um, there is a special ability for a two-month free trial for uh, listeners to this podcast, to the Media Sales Mastery podcast. So if you go to unmade.media forward slash MSM, standing for Media Sales Mastery, you'll uh, find how to give yourself a two-month trial. It's very generous of you, Tim. Thank you very much. I will link some details of that in the show description for the listeners who want to take advantage of that and certainly connect with myself and Tim and Damien on LinkedIn, um, and I'll add their LinkedIn's to the show notes too. Damien sent me a note the other day saying he is a he's binging on the podcast, which I was very flattered by, given you are a subscription model. So I said, well, that's um, that's particularly uh, particularly generous of a compliment, Damo. So. Well, I, I must admit, um, selfishly, we are, we're a subscription model for the first year, which is part of our deal with Substack. But come September, we're free to sell <laughs> advertising if we want. Oh, to. I can just think of all that pent up demand just waiting to waiting to come in. Well, I wish you the very best. I thank you so much for your generosity of your time. Congratulations on the book. Really fantastic synopsis. And Everyone in the industry, you know, really should read this book because it is the uh, the definitive guide to the sector that we all generate our livelihood from. So, Tim Burris, thank you for joining us this evening, and I really look forward to having you on in future episodes. Jamie, thanks very much for the invitation. You've been listening to Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic, guide the show, and don't forget to subscribe to receive new episodes each week.